Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, let me open this webinar, this WAS Talks on Science for Human Security. As uh, some of you know, in August 2023, the UN General Assembly proclaimed the International Decade of Sciences for Sustainable Development. It started this year and it will last until 2033. The task to lead the preparation and implementation of all the activities within the decade was given by the General Assembly to UNESCO. Connected to that in April this year, the Earth Humanity Coalition was founded as an, but it is a new association of global, regional and national scientific organizations with the task to prepare and implement in close cooperation with UNESCO various initiatives within the overall program of the decade. The World Academy of Arts and Art and Science was among the founding members of the coalition. It had initiated the Academy, the WAS Program of Sciences for Sustainable Development, which became, with the forming of the coalition, a specific initiative of the coalition. The last talks on science for human security, this one focused on artificial intelligence, is the fourth webinar within the program. The reports on the previous webinars can be found on the WAS website, and I suggest to all of you to go there and to, to go through to, to find interesting contributions. The page is events, I guess. It'll be easy to find that. Okay, that has been the uh, opening. Uh, Smidana, please go on as uh, the moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nebusha. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Nebusha, for your uh, thoughtful uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, our panel today, as Nebusha said, is part of the ongoing series of talks addressing human security and some of the key challenges uh, of our time. Uh, today's discussion is particularly important as we explore the evolving relationship between uh, artificial intelligence and human security. Um, AI technologies, uh, as I'm sure you have heard and read many times, hold big potential for improving quality of life, but they also present complex challenges uh, which are impacting every aspect of society, such as climate change, inequality, public health, and, and so on. The United Nations, as Nebisha mentioned, has declared the current decade as the International Decade of Sciences and Sustainable Development exactly to reflect uh, on the urgency of addressing such global uh, challenges. Uh, artificial intelligence is, we could say, at the forefront of these discussions uh, for the ways in which it could either safeguard or undermine human security linked to these critical uh, issues. So as we dive uh, into our panel today, we will explore the intersection of artificial intelligence with medicine, uh, climate change, social sciences, and law. We are joined by four distinguished speakers who will each bring their expert perspectives to these diverse uh, yet interconnected fields. Uh, we will first hear short statements from each of our panelists, and after that, we will transition to a discussion among the panelists, which will lead us to a conversation with all of you in the audience. Uh, if you have any questions or comments during this first part of the panel discussion, please submit them via the chat function. And I just want to mention that this session, like all sessions of the World Academy, is being uh, recorded. So I'm now uh, honored to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, first, we will hear from Sally Wyatt, who is a professor at Maastricht University and who will look at AI's transformative role in medicine. After that, Daniel Erasmus, who is the founder of Erasmus AI, will explore the intersection of AI and climate change. Deborah Lanzani, a researcher at Monash University, who will discuss AI's implications for the social sciences. And uh, Charlotte uh, Chider, uh, who is a professor of law at Loyola University Chicago, 
and who will uh, examine the legal and ethical dimensions of artificial intelligence. So to begin our panel, I would like to invite Sally Wyatt, uh, who, as I mentioned, will discuss the ways in which AI is transforming the field of medicine. Sally, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hope the uh, admin people can show my slides um, so you can all see them. I'll just wait for a moment. Oh, that looks promising. Um, Right. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I've, you know, I drew the long straw and I've got the wonderful time slot of, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, so I'm fine. Um, but thank you to everyone else who's participating in less friendly times from, from uh, slots. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I mean, I just have five minutes or so just to kind of kick off the discussion and want to raise some issues about kind of AI in medicine and healthcare more broadly. I've been doing work about kind of the use of digital technologies in healthcare for about 25 years now. Um, in the beginning around the internet as a source of health information, I've also done some work on direct to consumer genetic testing, things like um, companies like 23andMe that you may have heard of. And now, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, I'm doing some work about the use of AI in image-based clinical decision-making. It's basically pathology and radiology. This is one of the things I want to kind of highlight is um, that, you know, over these last 25 years, um, you see recurring claims that many of the same sorts of uh, claims are made about, you know, the use of the internet to find health information by patients, um, the possibilities to get your genetic test uh, online um, and all sorts of other things. And that, I mean, this is true of um, digital technologies and new technologies um, more broadly. Um, but I mean, I won't go through them in any great detail here, but you know, the, the idea that they're all always new and exciting and innovative, they're going to change relationships between patients and healthcare professionals for the better. Um, patients will become empowered. It won't matter where you are in order to access good quality health information and healthcare. Um, it will improve efficiency and reduce costs. Um, and, and I think perhaps most importantly um, for today that data and the algorithms uh, to process the data are increasingly the basis for medicine and healthcare. Um, so this is um, actually from our website and you can see the link up at the top if you should want to pursue it any further for the project I just mentioned about um, AI and clinical decision making, particularly image based. Um, I'm doing this together with Flora Leeson, also at Maastricht University, and um, Karen Jongsma, Megan Malotta, and Jojanneke Drocht at um, the University Hospital um, in Utrecht. Um, and we're actually almost at the end of this uh, project. So, you know, you can, if you click on, go to the website and click on some of those things, you might actually find something. Um, possibly not the film. The film is more or less ready, but probably won't be made available on the website until the end of the year. So I will talk a little bit about the uh, film in a moment. And we see the same kinds of claims. You know, these are just a bit more detailed. Um, you know, that, I mean, it's often... Um, uh, a kind of contest set up between AI and uh, medical professionals. In this case, you know, AI is going to beat the pathologists. Um, it goes faster to detect, to detect um, COVID. It outperforms it, you know, it's all of these sorts of things. We get a lot of these sorts of claims. And the most infamous, um, though I'm not quite sure what recent events mean, is that Jeffrey Hinton in 2016 claimed that, you know, really we should just stop training radiologists because of AI, we would no longer re need any radiologists. Um, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics um, a week or so ago, um, possibly not a Nobel Prize in um, future prediction. Um, so this um, is probably, this is a wonderful Dutch name. Um, this man was the Minister of Finance when he claimed this back in uh, 2020. He's now a European commissioner, um, Wopke Hoekstra. And again, you know, he's sort of saying, well, we don't know exactly how it's going to develop, but it's going to dramatically change everything. So again, and then he goes on to be um, specific about the work of the radiologist. It's going to become obsolete because again, the 
pictures are going to you know do better than the human um so again you see you know the same kinds of claims that we've been seeing about digital technologies for decades now extremely deterministic um but it hasn't always worked out this way so here we have a few more recent things where um, i mean some people are beginning to talk about a sort of crisis of credibility for ai um that uh, those promises of you know three, four, five years ago, people yeah, it hasn't quite delivered in quite the same way as people had hoped. Um, you know, IBM, which you know I don't know seven, eight years ago there was much excitement about IBM Watson Health. Um, yeah, they've now kind of chopped it up and sold little bits of it here and there. Um, many of the tools to help catch COVID didn't really work. Um, that we have. I imagine we'll be talking about this later, that the issues around bias, um, whether it's a racial bias or gender bias, um, and these can be really matters of life and death, quite literally, when it comes to AI in healthcare. So what at my next slide and my last slide is just a sort of reminder of things that I think we need to, you know, take more account of when thinking about the use of AI in um, healthcare. Um, one is incredibly complicated. <laughs> I mean, this is um, a typical, what my computer science friends sometimes say to me that, you know, those of us in the social sciences and humanities just go around making things more difficult and more complicated. Um, but actually things are difficult and complicated. You can't just, you know, build something and throw it over the wall into the hospital and hope it's going to be taken up. Um, and particularly in medicine and healthcare, there are very, very complex regulatory and uh, political issues. Um, another thing that I think is really important is, I mean, and I've been guilty of this myself in the last few minutes, is that AI can be many, many, many things, uh, but yet we often talk about it in the singular. You know, it, AI is gonna do this or that. And I think one of the challenges we had in the project is that you know, we also wanted to look at what patients thought about the use of AI in their diagnosis. Um, it was actually very, very difficult to, you know, you know what do we actually mean here? Because um, some things people, hospitals said, oh, well, you could have a look at this. I thought, well, actually, that's just a decision support system that's probably been around since 1995. Um, so, but now we're calling it AI. Um, so that's something to pay, be very careful of. But many issues of um, uncertainty, risk, trust, and responsibility, which are kind of merging together here. Enormous economic and environmental costs. Um, also, and something this might come up later, is... We're introducing a major new player into healthcare. And of course, a lot depends um, where you are located. Healthcare in the United States is very different than healthcare in most European countries. But um, the, the kind of regulatory environment, the role of big tech companies now in the provision of important elements of healthcare, it's also something that needs, I kind of think, more attention. And then what is often, often forgotten when talking about the use of any kind of technology in healthcare, um, and I noticed this a lot when we were doing the work on people finding information, is that sometimes people are really, really ill and expecting them to make informed decisions about complex matters um, is sometimes asking a lot. So, you know, what does it mean when we're introducing very complex advanced technologies um, into the healthcare system when you have a lot of vulnerable people. When we were trying to think about this as well for our project, you know, we found that many radiologists and pathologists didn't particularly understand how AI worked in their domain. So what, you know, how we would expect patients to understand this was also kind of a challenging, how we would expect primary health um, people to explain this to patients. It's also rather challenging. So I think there's lots and lots to, even though there are, I think, many positive things we can do with um, AI and other digital technologies in the provision of healthcare. I do think there are many issues we need to consider. And I've probably gone over time, but thank you. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Thank you so much, Sally. And it was uh, really important to start actually with this uh, issue that uh, really affects all of us. Uh, so uh, each person on this earth, uh, planet earth, of course, uh, cares about their health and uh, health of their 
loved ones and their communities and and so on so ai is definitely something that or that impact of ai in in that sphere is definitely something that will have huge uh impact on all of us and thank you for your really um nuanced actually uh even though short uh introduction into all this and we will have a chance to talk more about some of the uh questions that you uh, raised so thank you for for that uh, next, we will have uh, we will hear from uh, Daniel Erasmus, who will talk about another very important issue uh, today. So he will share his thoughts on the role of uh, artificial intelligence in addressing climate change. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, and thank you, Sally, for a very nuanced and wonderfully critical uh, speech about AI. I, I, I've been hanging with. Um, a lot of these um, uh, sort of AI pundits, and I uh, just refreshing <laughs> to hear you speak about these things. Um, I think it's uh, often technology is so overstated and so ungrounded in um, human practice and the complexity of it, particularly when people complain about the complexity of the space when actually that's what we're trying to address. Um, so, um, <clears throat> just as a very brief background, um, um, uh, the we were asked to give a, uh, a talk a couple of years ago on the promise and perils of AI. It's just at the start of these things. And I, I, I found um, um, the speech, um, uh, or the, the, the kind of broad circumstances of it very much, sort of the broad social perils of it and you know the technology overstating, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the real risk of our age is climate change not AI, and of course there are many, many risks and many, many things, but clearly um, by, you know, we are beyond a 1.5 degree world and uh, by a good margin already, and um, we need to prepare our worlds for a very, very different future. And so we thought we were in a unique position, and I'll show some, some things now, but we're in a unique position to address um, these challenges uh, and using some of the capabilities of AI um, to augment our intelligence, to augment decision-making and support a transition at the scale of 100 to $300 trillion that we're going to have to allocate uh, differently. So a little bit earlier decisions, a little bit smarter decisions could make significant differences. Um, the first thing is, you know, it's um, I, artificial intelligence isn't interesting. Um, what we're looking at is a social intelligence project, you know, climate social intelligence. So how can we use this incredible power of this technology um, really to um, um, change um, the structure of the debate and support the structure of the debate um, with a little bit better knowledge and um, showing the interconnections which people would have otherwise missed um, uh, at the scale of the planet in a rapidly. And the task of our age can be thought of as, there's a delta of the climate changing. Um, and can we get our social systems, our social, economic, political, uh, technological systems to be able to change faster than what the climate is changing? Obviously, there's structural things built in, so we're going to be, have to be some, a lot faster than that. But re that really comes down to that's the challenge of our age. And so we wanted to apply, and um, I'll show some things of it. The paper is um, open um, uh, there, it's openly published, the model is open source. Uh, we were tremendously uh, heartened by both the partnership with the Club of Rome in developing this model, using the Earth for All work to support that, as well as and the partners with which we established the model, first model, which was Equity Labs and Aptex. So we've had just fantastic support for this. And we built this on top of an extreme weather human-centered dashboard. So we tend to think of the climate very much as the weather, um, and, but we're in the Anthropocene now. And so what is happening is um, we're getting a significant shift here in um, the effects that this is having on us. And so showing those uh, instances makes a, a, a tremendous difference. And um, let me, I have to switch gears here. And so um, when one looks at this, one can suddenly start to see, um, go into Brazil and you can see what the events are. We can see in September, there was a set of instances. This is open, publicly available. But more interesting enough is we can zoom in down to see at that village. So we 
process about a quarter of a billion URLs per day. And one can see down to those are the articles. And, you know, AI models are, they're about 80, 80 to 90% proper classification. So there will be some errors in this, as well as human classification, to be honest. Um, but suddenly one can see this, not at the level of sovereign. And what one sees is a massive underreporting um, of Global South and a massive underreporting of these um, events um, as they happen. And um, to give a sense of this in Kenya, they were striving to get 15 million mosquito nets um, to address the flooding, uh, which happened in November um, there. So there's massive challenges that we're facing us. And, um, and then a, a, a chatbot um, underneath the extreme weather set is obviously um, climate GPT, but also a chatbot. So you can say, what are the breakthroughs in um, renewables? Um, I'm just adding typos here, just as a flat, okay. Change this. So we're just keeping it highly generic. And immediately one can see uh, it's a multi-perspective view. Um, firstly, which we wanted to show here. So both social, economic, scientific risk and investment. And one can see a good starting point, plus um, references taken from just under 3 million um, sort of climate change in its broadest sense, um, facts there. So one can see where those ideas come from. And you can say, you know, uh, focus on systemic um, changes rather than technology. Cool. And, um, and immediately it starts to shift because we tend to think of these things always as technical breakthroughs or some magical technology that will solve everything. Uh, and so one can discuss and carry on with these things. I know I'm over time, but um, it's there, it's freely available, um, it's open to everybody. And the intent is just not as an artificial intelligence project, but as a social intelligence project. Thank you so much, Daniel, and thank you for this uh, great uh, presentation and introduction into uh, Climate uh, GPT. I'm sure we will uh, have a chance to hear more about it and, and your work at Erasmus uh, AI uh, throughout this panel and in the future. Thank you for now. And we are now going to go from the Netherlands to uh, Australia. And to hear from Deborah. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much for joining today and for staying late at night, uh, your time, so <clears throat> that you can uh, talk to us. Deborah will be talking about AI's impact on the social sciences. So, Deborah, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Um, thank you for inviting me with this amazing people. I'm really um, I, I enjoy a lot Sally's um, Daniel presentation, and I sure I will enjoy Charlotte. Okay. Um, first, um, as as Miliana said, I'm in Australia at the moment in Melbourne, and so I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, which is the traditional owners of the land I'm standing now, and also respect the past, the present, and the emerging leaders. And also I want to acknowledge all my colleagues from social science that are uh, working hard to make sense of not only AI, but what's going on with uh, our social worlds and our the future of the planet. And I want to talk uh, from my perspective, uh, but I want to acknowledge all the other perspectives because it's a lot of people working really hard. And sometimes as Sally said, um, in our relationship with other science, we get into this kind of people problem, <laughs> people uh, in charge of them, talking for them, translating them, or even problematizing, bringing people to the live, which apparently is not there. Um, so um, I went, when Esmeralda invited me to this talk, I was um, torn into two things are happening around social science now. One is how AI or generative AI is impacting our own profession as researchers and, and the topics and the, the problems we research, but also what is challenging 
when we look at AI about the role of social science in relation of the changes and transformations we are looking at. And I decide to go for the second one, how social science uh, could engage differently with uh, AI. And part of the, this, um, the idea to go to that side is what Sally present in, in, uh, in her talk about uh, this uh, idea of emerging technologies hype that we end up uh, discussing the, what other science, other social actors, or other bodies like uh, companies, governments uh, propose us as the problem. Um, so for this presentation, which it, I said preempting AI futures, because it's what I, I think we try to do in the place I work with this immersion tech lab in, in Monash University, is trying to understand the futures, the inclusive futures and communitary futures and tech futures that uh, could be intervened with, along with other actors. And I, I'm an anthropologist, so I will uh, ground this talk in, in two projects I have been working in in the last years and also my uh, what I did for the PhD, which is working in Internet of Things in Europe and the merging of Internet of Things and the visions of futures um, with developers, understanding how they under, uh, understood that technology and the role of that technology in the social world they were surrounded. Um, and also having working in the last years in these two projects, um, one trying to understand how people work via, with AI, how they learn to work in, in with platforms, um, it, particularly the NMILE, people working for the platform, not developing the platform the platforms, and also Order World, which is a project to, um, that is uh, trying, this is still ongoing and is trying to understand ethnographically and in, in uh, with around the concept of future, how workers are working along with automation and AI in three sectors, construction, health, and uh, sales. And I have been working in health here in Australia in, in a hospital doing field work with the nurses, doctors, and other clinicians in, in the everyday life. And they work with um, some automated features and um, artificial intelligence. And I uh, bring in from this what I call ethnographic figurations, how people are actually dealing with these technologies and what are the expectations they have and what are like the promises they are bringing to their everyday life from all these other actors uh, talking about AI. But particularly, I, I want also uh, from this ethnographic background, from, from this project, and also my experience trying to, to engage with the topics as Miliana proposed us. Um, and I was, I, I was uh, thinking to connect in certain way four things, which is the idea of risk, the tech world, people developing this technology, people like making the, fl the flow of money around this, and also the people, uh, policy makers uh, and media producers around AI, and also the future of work, which is part of my, uh, central in my work. And, uh, the, the global, the, the labor relationships around AI. Let's see if I can do this. Um, but in, to connect all of that with social science, um, my, my point to, to propose is, which will be the role of a social science that engage with all these factors at the same time, understanding that AI is more a constellation of things that are piece of technology. It's a process, ongoing process that has not only the systems, which what, what, what is the system, but also the notions, the configuration of this technology from the concepts and from the way people live with it. So if social science want to understand the risk for people and communities with this, should be working in embedding what this technology actually is and what is going on, which is the difference of a narrative around a technology coming from the, the for example, this um, open AI or whatever, or other example, which is much uh, more 
contemporary to or for this week, which is the one or one chat GBT um, of the promises that they are bringing of this, as Sally said, like disrupting um, technology and actually understanding what is the technology, where are the, the, the features and possibilities for this technology and bringing things um, and not engaging with the hype. So on one hand is critical thinking, but another is making new meaningful concept with the people developing and with the communities that, for example, in the case of Sali Health uh, or other other communities um, having AI uh, as something in within them. And particularly, I would I will give the example if in the future of war. Social scientists has been dealing with this kind of this topic and utopic idea of replacement, displacement, and reskilling and skilling. But the truth is like there is few actual research about what's going on with the AI in the traditional industries and in the emerging industries like platform, for example. And the research that is there, which is showing actually, is that people are not afraid of losing the job. What they are afraid of is not having the promise of the technology and not, or not catching up with what is bringing. Um, another um, particular point in the future of war is like this has been, at least in social science, we have been responding to uh, vernacular uh, or vernacular and lexicon coming from an economy, um, from economy, and not, I'm not saying the economy is not a social science. What I'm saying is economy in terms of the relationship between the economy and the market and what in, in, in science and technology is called the expectation of the market, the rules that make the technology happen in terms of an, a, an economic a, or a potential market. And in my view, social science has been following that lead, which is particularly inexistent when you go to the fieldwork and you understand how people are actually working with technology. So one of the things that social science, at least in the future of work, as example could do, is revisit the vernacular lexicon, vernacular and lexicon that we are using, for example, skills, um, um, in the light of what is going in the world. And I will give you one stat, an example of that. In 2022, 28.9 million of people were working already with uh, technology with, in, in or for plat platforms. Platform, I mean, uh, from data brokers to delivery. And at, at, in 2022, 29 million of people in the European Union were working in the traditional industry. So it's, it's almost the same quantity of people related to uh, an algorithmic management of economic management that in traditional industry. In that context, for example, the concept of skills, replacement and displacement don't make sense. Don't make sense. And the same with... Uh, this idea of AI uh, will come as isolated technology, which is, we know, you know in social science, we have been working with this a lot, is not only deterministic, but also simplistic, because we know technologies don't work in isolation, and Charlotte could talk about this in the regulation, in the problems with regulating something, right? Um, but the truth is most of workers are already in, in working in current conditions and contingent and, and on technological circumstances. Uh, that the are change, those circumstances are changing on the light of AI, but that, that is not what will determine the future of the work. What will determine the future of work is that relation established with the subjectivities of workers, the, the access to the means of work, and also uh, in, and in terms, uh, particularly in terms of AI, which kind of new geographies will appear that will AI uh, keep uh, the ecosystem already happen, for example, in the United States, or they will be distributed and start new ecosystems in different countries that could emerge different labor markets. Uh, all the possibilities are things that I, I, 
I find much more interesting for social science to explore than the risk. Um, and, I, and with this, I'm not saying that it's not important to take into account, and I, I hope we will discuss more of this in, 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 in the rest of the seminar, but I'm not saying it's not important to understand the algorithmic systems, uh, uh, how it affects uh, people's lives or bias or criticize the way that this has been coined um, in different with this, uh, this other social actors, but also try to understand what actual, the actual circumstances of, of people dealing with these technologies from that development to the everyday life of people in different parts of the world. And the last uh, thing which I think is uh, central is a start to rethink the vernacular visions of future of the AI. And again, I'm, and I'm, because I have been working with techies, I want to be very specific with that. When I talk about AI, I'm talking about generative AI because we are talking about that hype. But AI is plenty of technologies around us that are embedded with uh, from machine learning to code architectures and are like now entitled as AI. But I'm talking about this this kind of uh, media conceptualization of what AI is. This is this uh, technology has the power to generate things as uh, emulating humans. And in that sense, I want also to bring uh, with this, I will close. Um, the when I talk with the people designing technology for the hospital I'm doing field work now, and also people that have been working in different projects in the past and now are working in in AI, because and I think that as um, people, uh, anthropologists working with AI know very well that, like I, I think Mina Rockenstein is on the audience. She's is, is one of the biggest name in the research in AI. Um, and we know that techies are not afraid of the same thing that the discourse about technology um, are trying to share what is afraid. And when we talk about them, what actually they are afraid of AI and why most of the, the developers of, for example, OpenAI or like Big uh, Tree in China are leaving the companies saying that they are afraid in the way that they are um, developing these technologies. They, they never said this, what AI could do or this idea of the super intelligence that will uh, change everything. They say is there is no guide of what to do. We are not guided to anything. So we are going like blind, developing a technology that could be harmful when it's out. So that, and I want to, uh, um, I want to close with this. That is a, 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 an open door for social science. We will engage with people developing technology. We will engage with the governments uh, um, deciding what could be or not. We will be prepared for the next technology, like let's say quantum computing, or we will engage again with the high proposed by the market and other actors. Uh, my view is we need to engage with the actual process of, of designing this technology from development to media policy. Uh, and, and, and having a possibility of oh, plan a future, a planetary future, not just deal with the um, consequences of of others' actions. Um, I, I hope I use five minutes because it's really late and I'm, I'm trying to make sense. So I hope I did on time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah. This was a, a, a really nice uh, overview of uh, how social scientists uh, can engage with, with AI. And I know that you are doing some great work at the Emerging uh, Technologies Lab at Monash. So I hope that we will have a chance to hear also more about some of your projects. And finally, we are now going to uh, Charlotte, who uh, opposite to Deborah, who stayed really late to talk to us. Charlotte, on the other hand, got up really early in the morning. So Charlotte <laughs> is calling in from Chicago. Charlotte, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, Charlotte will uh, talk to us about AI and law. All right. Well, thank you so much for including me in this great group. Um, I've really enjoyed the introduction so far, and I know we'll have a really wonderful discussion as we start to ask questions both to each other um, and wonderful questions from you, Smiljana. Um, So 
I'm going to just do kind of an introduction into some of the key categories in AI and the law and where we see a lot of recent interest. The first is one, because a lot of attorneys, we want to ensure our own existence. And this, I think, connects to some of the things that Deborah was saying, is about the practice of law. What effect is AI going to have in how we do our jobs? What is AI's effect on people who are new to the industry, to people who have been in the industry for a long period of time? And how do we do, how do we engage in legal representation in a way that is fair for our clients? for people to make sure that they are getting what they are expecting. So that's one kind of area. Another one is the use of artificial intelligence to automate legal processes. So examples would be in court actions, in regulatory processes. Um, AI is being used uh, today, at least in the United States, but I suspect elsewhere, to automate a lot of internal regulatory processes, to make things easier, to require less staffing, uh, to make processes more efficient than perhaps they have been in the past, at least theoretically, that is the, the idea. And then the third category is the regulation and ramifications of AI in a variety of different industries and in government. And this is an area where I have the most interest um, I spend a lot of time thinking about data protection, about medical device technologies, areas where individual people could potentially be harmed by their misuse um, or their non-responsible use. So I wanted to talk about some of the trade-offs and some of the relationships between different values we might have and what that impact might look like. So first of all, we have to determine, and I, I think Sally had mentioned this as well, an accurate way to identify risk of these systems. And I think that what we've seen from a legal perspective, and we've seen a lot of movement from the EU, which is fantastic, I think, in leading this discussion. But how do we figure out what the real risk is, not just the inherent risk, meaning that you know we have these systems that seem like they could be dangerous, but also how they're used in practice and what other types of risks other than kind of what is obvious within that system um, could occur if we think about these technologies on a more broad perspective. So across an industry, for example, across a population. And I think that it might be a little bit more nuanced than perhaps we've thought in the past, which is primarily around a safety perspective and primarily around a data protection perspective. The second concept related to kind of trade-offs and this idea is our connectedness and our need for data. Um, you know, certainly I think most of us who have some familiarity with AI know that data is essential to the function of um, effective AI in many respects. We also know that uh, getting that data, uh, whether it is getting it off of the web, you know, scraping data, or if it's using kind of repurposing data that we've collected in the past, whether it's data exchanges, data sharing agreements, um, or collection from individual people, all of these carry with them new challenges. But the central kind of problem is that we need a lot of it. And so the question is, to what degree do we trade off how we currently think about um, different rights with respect to that data, whether those are contractual rights, whether those are individual rights. Um, are we willing to relax those standards in the name of potentially more responsible or safer AI? I don't know that we know that yet. Um, I think that that's part of a lot of the new discussions we're going to be having. And then finally is the relationship between accuracy and impact. And certainly the environment is one of the areas where we're seeing this, of course, because to have really accurate AI, at least today, um, it means that you're going to use a tremendous amount of resources. So the question is, how accurate do we need to be and in what circumstances? And this also ties to the concept of data usage as well. How much data do we need to create um, effective training models? How much data do we need to tune those models? And then what kind of a setup do we actually need to create a product that's going to be accurate? And are the costs worth that investment? 
Um, certainly, as many of us have seen, a lot of the recent interest in artificial intelligence tends to be more related to things that I would describe as more, um, I would say, less essential and more fun. Now, that's OK, right? Everybody's entitled to have a little bit of fun. Um, but the reality is, if we are prioritizing um, resource allocation to AI that are primarily for entertainment or for general cons consumption over essential services and other really important um, you know, things that we might need AI for, we might have to make some decisions ultimately in, in what that might look like. Today, we're not really, I guess, confronted with a lot of those issues because AI feels new and because at least in a lot of countries, it is still pretty under-regulated. So a few kind of concepts that I think are worth teasing out. And I don't want to call these dichotomies exactly because they really are not exactly competing values, but we're going to have to figure out how to balance them. So the first one is, and I talked about this a little bit already, is the relationship of individual rights to collective interests. I think especially in the data protection realm, this is where we see um, some natural friction which is when we are prioritizing the rights of an individual, ultimately that means that we can do less with data. There are more hindrances to using that data. There's more gatekeeping related to using that data. But if we tilt it in favor of the collective, that means that we're making decisions about a person's interests in that data, their autonomy. Um, in the health sciences, of course, this is related to information about our biological characteristics, which can make us feel pretty uncomfortable if someone's using those without our knowledge or consent. Um, certainly we have special categories of data that require a lot more to use them. But if our prioritization is on something like AI safety in areas that are really critical, that might mean that how we conceive of that data might have to shift in some way. We don't yet know what that will look like. Um, we've already seen some interest in sort of the expansion of legitimate interest and what that can mean. Um, but largely, a lot of the folks I talk to in the data protection realm, um, you know, they're a little bit concerned about that because it feels like the loophole that swallows the whole, right? If everything is legitimate and we can't get the balance right, ultimately that might open the door to sort of untethered use um, of a lot of data that could be really important to people. The second area is related to how we regulate and sort of the balance of how we regulate. Um, and this is the relationship between ex ante, sort of, you know, before the fact regulation versus ex post recovery. What happens when things go wrong and everything in between? I think that the model that we have used, at least prioritized in most countries other than the United States, has been pushing resources ex ante, right? Getting ahead of the problem, trying to regulate before something is in the marketplace, before something is used. But ex post has a lot of really useful characteristics also, which is we can't always anticipate, especially with AI, which has a lot of foreseeability issues related to safety. You know, sometimes it behaves in ways that we don't expect. So we need a way to um, whether it is collectively, whether it is by regulators, whether it's by individual people, the ability to recover when things go wrong. And at least what we're seeing in the United States is when you invest more in the ex ante perspective, we expect that there will be less ability to recover ex post, right? With the idea that if an organization has invested resources up front, they should not expect to have to invest a lot of resources later. But I think that this is an area where we need both. And ultimately in a lot of countries where folks are not maybe exercising their rights ex post, there might need to be more interest in that space too, um, you know, to really hold organizations accountable. And then the final one that I wanted to talk about, um, you know, and I'll, I'll start to wrap here because I know we have a lot of conversations to be had is the relationship between privacy and safety. I think that in relation to this idea of the individual and the collective is inherently this idea of what are people willing to give up 
to have products that ultimately are safer. And this dovetails, I think, with some of the things that Sally is talking about, where individuals are making decisions related to information that's important to them in the moment. So if you're in a healthcare situation, for example, your prioritization of what values are most important to you is probably going to be different than somebody's prioritization of values if they are thinking about buying a connected coffee maker, you know, or espresso machine. Um, Ultimately, it's just very different. It's highly contextual. And so how do we provide the appropriate information so somebody is able to make an informed decision in a way that makes sense to them in that moment? And ultimately, that might mean that it's not all about individual choice. Maybe in some cases, we have to protect people when they can't protect themselves. Um, And this is something that I think, at least in the United States, is highly criticized, right? We want people to be able to make individual choices um, all of the time. But in many situations, they simply either can't get the information or are not in a position to understand the details of that information. And one of the biggest problems with artificial intelligence is that even if you provide the very best privacy notice, even if you have someone there discussing that privacy notice with them, um, even if you have somebody there who's discussing uh, from an informed consent perspective what the potential issues could be, there is so much behind the scenes, um, both from a privacy perspective and a safety perspective and a sustainability perspective, Um, that ultimately could complicate that decision-making process. And these are, and and this occurs kind of all over the world, Uh, there are a lot of private contracts, a lot of private relationships related to infrastructure, related to how AI systems are built, related to how data are stored, how data are structured, Um, the degree to which we have cybersecurity controls in place or not, um, how advanced those controls are, how exposed those connections are, um, all of that can affect the decision-making process. But how much time does a person have when they're making a critical decision about what to buy or what healthcare direction they want to take to understand all of those nuances? And ultimately, because the organizations that create AI often are many steps removed from the moment when somebody is making a decision about AI, Um, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get to that level of detail, even if somebody wanted to. So we really have to rethink what that decision-making process looks like and what the legal vehicles we use to motivate those decisions could look like. So I look forward to conversation with everybody. I think it'll be uh, really energetic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. And this was a great introduction into that area that is uh, very important for for all of us and for the future of uh, AI development and uh, society and uh, human security. So um, thank you to all the speakers, actually, for those really insightful contributions that all of you brought. I have a million questions. Uh, I hope that people in the audience do have uh, questions as well for you. I wanted to give you a chance first uh, to actually ask questions of each other. So do you, does anyone on the panel have a question for another panelist? Do you absolutely have priority in that? So if there is anyone who has a question, yes, Sally, I see that you can, hmm? please go. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure it's a question, but... um... Uh, yeah, I mean, they were all great. Thank you so much to um, Daniel and Deborah and Charlotte. I mean, really, really interesting. I think they do speak to each other in interesting ways. And I don't think we're going to cover it all in the next 35 minutes, but OK. Um, I mean, one of the things that struck me by what Charlotte said was also about um, data and, you know, how important data are to the functioning of AI. And I kind of briefly mentioned that as well. And I think it came up in something Daniel said as well. There was some nice um, phrase Daniel had about human classifications. I'm kind of wondering what the non-human classifications are, but um, that's maybe a very side question. Um, And I think, I mean, obviously data are really, really important. And one thing I didn't get a chance to kind of mention, I, I alluded to it, was Um, the film that we've been making about um, the work of pathologists was how much 
craft labor, and this is also relevant for Deborah, how much craft labor is needed to turn human tissue into something that's machine readable. <laughs> um, and I think that's true for an awful lot of domains. I mean, obviously in healthcare and pathology, when you're taking cells or tumors or whatever, and you just slice them up really tiny and put them in little things and, you know, preserve them with dyes and wax and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, seeing that process, A, it's a kind of wonderful reminder of the materiality, but but that's, you know, and automating that, I think, is going to be really, really difficult. Um, and But actually what people then talk about, by and large, are the machine-readable images that pathologists at some later stage are able to look at and maybe or maybe not share with one another, and this relates to the classification question is that sometimes that gets really, really difficult because, you know, one literally one hospital is using one set of even in the same countries, different hospitals use different classification systems. I mean, there's a wonderful article or book chapter in um, Meredith Broussard's um, recent book uh, called More Than a Glitch. I don't know if some of you have read that in which she describes her own experience of having breast cancer and getting her hands on the data um, and share, you know, she happened to, it was during COVID. I mean, it's a fascinating account. Um, and finding that, you know, breast cancer sort of algorithms, each model comes up with a different answer and is, because they're using different data. Um, and, you know, this is fantastically important um, when it comes to healthcare, but equally with all sorts of other kinds of systems, certainly when it comes to the climate crisis, but, you know, um, there's been a infamous case in the Netherlands where uh, paying out of child benefits that went really, really badly wrong. So, um, you know, data and classifications, topics I find utterly fascinating, but I was wondering if you could, um, you know, maybe other examples from your own kind of work, uh, share those. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just add that um, this is true across every sector. We've seen the problem in mass transportation, right? <laughs> how do you get um, an effective representation of how, for example, all the trains function in New York City um, or across Europe as a way of considering autonomous um, autonomous trains or other modes of transportation. I mean, this is an area where there could be a lot of efficiencies and it's, you know, it's not necessarily um, true from like a future work perspective that might be um, undesirable, but I think that also um, folks see a lot of promise in having these types of systems, but how would you even begin to design a system like that if you don't have adequate data? Okay. You're, you're sort of expecting that a lot of things will go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we don't always know a lot ultimately about what the systems are trained on um, and how they might be used. And I think that's highly problematic. There are a lot of AI systems that have been trained on data that is not even so like in the healthcare area. I know systems that have not even been trained on health data. They've been used on completely other data types and then are sort of shoehorned um, to be used in healthcare. And this is happening everywhere. Um, so we don't ultimately know a lot, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Can I add something about uh, on what Charlotte is saying? Because I think she said something in the talk that I feel is central to understand any AI constellation. And it's like, we, we still believe there is a kind of moment that we will arrive in with accurate, credible, and reliable information. And that will never happen. It always will be dependent, not only in the data we introduce to train the systems or to apply or, or to make the system work, but also in how people design the technology. Nowadays, the object oriented is even people coding AI, they don't know what is inside of the architecture. So the abstraction is so big that if we don't move the the, the idea of uh, this idea of an, an eternal uh, line that we will arrive on accuracy then we are lost and one of the thing um i read today actually in the morning is um this uh, 01 chat gpt uh, which is not the chat gpt 5 but is a new kind of, of relation with the, the the connection with data that this this uh, entity can uh, look for different answers and compare because actually there's no one answer 
to any question. So that that will never happen. There will, or if it happened, that when we need to rethink. But I think we need to move from from this idea. If we talk about legislation or health or things that are central for our future, this idea of will be accuracy, will be credibility, because it will not happen. I I, I think that the. Um... I mean, one of the challenges here is um, in model building, so which which I can speak with some some degree of um, uh, knowledge about is um, the, the the problem of gold standard data sets. You know, you're you're training a model and you want to get some level of confidence in the data set that you're training the model on, and you know, just as a sort of a first humble proposal, <laughs> and is. We shouldn't call it AI. We should call it large statistical machines. And wherever the word AI is mentioned, just change it with really large statistical machines. Now, there's a different debate, you know, on, on, on our own um, um, consciousness here, and that's a separate debate. But for now, we have large statistical machines that at its cutting edge is more or less the same amount of weights as a house count. You know, that's what we have now. And as enamored as, enamored as we are with this technology, and as wonderful it has its moments and it's critical, uh, you know, it's still barely a house cat and a lot less than a house cat if you just weigh the neurons versus, um, say, chat GPT-4 plus um, those things. So it's not close to anything. Um, and, and, you know, but the challenge of large uh, or sort of gold standard data sets. So in training um, climate GPT, you kind of want to ground it with an, a particular set of responses. and and, um, uh, you know, the first challenge is that the gold standard data sets, because it's so large that you need, there is no human that can actually process that data sets. You can have well curated data sets, you can get a good overview of it, you can do statistical sampling of that, you can build visualization networks, all that, and understand how those things are. And those are sets of tasks that one goes through. But, but, but you know, having that, and so... The, the challenges of classifying data, so there was my earlier um, point there to go back to Sally's point, is that if you ask a human, an expert, um, to classify data, 83% is sort of um, what we can bear. <laughs> and so um, that's one. Two is experts are weak predictors of the future. You know, time and time again, experts anticipating the future way underscore the general population, even uh, chimpanzees throwing darts, you know. so. Not just are the data sets not really gold standard, we don't have overview of them, um, and they have multiple perspectives in them. The best, if you were to have thousands and millions of people working through them, only 80% of that data will be actually gold standard, and you won't know which 80% it actually is. And then lastly is that the, um, the capability of having anticipatory logic in the models, which is kind of what we want, because we don't want to reify the past, um, you want to have some level of anticipation. Uh, in the models, otherwise, you know, there's a bunch of simple tasks which, God bless, my AI should be doing, not humans. Um, but um, those are incredibly challenging bits, and the bias inside these gold standard data data sets or supposed gold standard is deep, it's unexamined, and it's fairly obtuse. Um, so for us, the challenge was we relied on the gold standard, which was um, sort of the international development community. So. What did the OECD write about climate? What did the IPCC write about climate? The Club of Rome's own work on that, which is quite critical about some of those things. The World Bank's work on that. Um, the uh, World Resources Institute, the International uh, Renewable Energy Agency. So these things. But it really has a focus from the global north, looking at the global south with a particular development view. There's not much written in Kenya on the challenges of climate policies or in Sri Lanka or in Ghana or in this. And many of those global South countries have climate liabilities and have had none of the economic benefits of putting the CO2 in the air um, in the first place. And so it, it stayed as a challenge for us. And we said, okay, let's just get to accurate answers first and, and, and grounded accurate answers first um, and then start to work at the problem of broadening it, but it will persist as a massive challenge within the system and largely unexamined or critically assumed, as long as we call it artificial intelligence instead of large statistical machines. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you all for this additional uh, comments and uh, uh, explanations. Uh, Daniel, I will, uh, you know, uh, use your uh, uh, term of large statist statistical machines, although of course it is not so catchy and so interesting like artificial intelligence with sound so promising and scary at the same time. But just to, to follow up on what uh, pretty much all of you, I think, were saying, my question is, what do you see? And I see that we are already getting some questions from the audience to which uh, I will go after asking my question. So what do you see as some of the good practices that we currently have for establishing and scrutinizing the, the credibility of those large statistical machines? And just Warren, just just to add something. Sorry, I've, I've just been now, but um, uh, you, you know, we started by saying give a multiple perspective answer, and just different perspectives, just add a different perspectives. So um, users of these large statistical machines, um, commonly referred to as AI, um, though they can see that there are indeed very very different machines, and it's not that the agents talk to each other in some long founded no. It's simply language prompts that you use to reveal topologies which are inherent in networks. That's how it works. Um, there's no conversation going on. Um, yeah. So showing multiple perspectives in user response um, brings a certain level of humility to that, brings the thing that most of the interesting questions you would deal with have multiple perspectives um, and allows users some agencies agency in, in, in opening up was clearly any complex, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the Large Hydrogen Collider or any serious complex machine that we have in our day and age is, you know, the phone here is fundamentally impossible to understand for its user base. That's the characteristic of our age. And we simply can't wish that away. Um, the question is what level of agencies would have people in this and what are the broader social impact that these technologies have as they cascade through our social political economy system. And they're largely unexamined. Thank you. Sally, if we go back to your example about the breast cancer patient who gets uh, different results from different systems. So what would be some possible ways in, in such cases about thinking how do we determine and scrutinize credibility of those different uh, machines and different results that we're getting? And I'm perhaps a little less um, pessimistic than Daniel about, you know, some of these things being fundamentally kind of important. And, you know, I work in a university. I like to think education helps um, that, um, that, you know, more and more education about, you know, how these things actually work, helping people understand um you know, some of the issues that we've been talking about, whether it's about the source of the data, the how the models get trained and all the rest of it, I think helps people deal with that. I think one of the, and this is something I observed in the very early work I did about health information. I think one of the big problems is, is that probability difficult concept. <laughs> and a lot of people have a lot of problems understanding probability, which is really fundamental, especially in a lot of the healthcare stuff. And, and the breast cancer case was a little bit different because it was, um, you know, the, the genetic testing is all about probability. You may get this disease at some point in the future with 37% chance or whatever. Um, but, you know, in this case, you either have it, you know, binary thing based on, you know, the examination of the tissue eventually. I mean, the but in the mammography, it was um, a different process to kind of say, well, what's, do we need to do any kind of um, examination of the tissue? But sort of related to breast cancer, but not entirely. I mean, my favorite example of um, the good use of um, big data, if you like in healthcare, comes from Denmark, where they have very detailed um, population data. Um, okay, it's a relatively small country, um, most of the time reasonably social democratic country. Um, and, you know, they do have population data. And when somebody or some anti-abortion slash pro-life group in the United States tried to claim that um, having an abortion uh, was highly, you know, a good predictor of developing cancer later in life, um, which 
is not true for anybody listening. Um, but, you know, these kinds of claims are made in uh, certain political climates at the moment. And the Danes got together and looked at their population data and said, this is just not true. <laughs> you know, we've got the data on who's had an abortion, who's not, who's developed what forms of cancer, and there is really no correlation here, people. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to convince the people who made the claim in the first place, but I thought it was a good use of, you know, with all of the kind of caveats and problems of population data and classification and the rest of it, as to how we kind of regulate. And I mean, I, I do, on my less optimistic moments, I do sometimes get worried about the massive multiplication of ethical codes for AI. <laughs> um, there's an awful lot of them out there. I mean, I think I need a kind of large statistical machine to kind of interpret them. But um, so, I mean, I do, yeah, I have faith on a good day in education. I also have faith in the state rule of law. So the lawyers need to get on with it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that we all have some of those, uh, you know, more pessimistic and more optimistic days when it comes to to um, large statistical machines. You see, Daniel, we now all adopted your term. Uh, there is one question uh, from the audience related to data. So I will uh, read uh, that one. It says, for data, should the publishing industry be able to claim new IP rights to uh, prevent large statistical machines from reading? So I am not an expert in copyright, but I will at least say that um, I do think this is a huge issue. I think that a lot of, especially the large language models that are geared towards consumer use are engaged in broad web scraping. Um, and in fact, it takes a tremendous amount of resources to do that. So we should be you know, aware of that. Um, even contacting these websites at the frequency that often they are automatically contacted takes resources from those websites too. So I think that what we're likely to see, at least what I'm hearing will actually happen is that a lot of these entities will be pursuing um, sort of technical solutions to prevent this from happening. I think that there have been um, a fair amount of suits where there's interest in claiming additional copyright um, rights or reinforcing copyrights, um, sort of pushing back against, at least in the United States, what we call fair use, but um, you know, sort of reasonable, um, reasonable use and kind of a small scale that has been generally appropriate in a lot of legal regimes for the use of um, otherwise copywritten information. I think, though, that we can't necessarily, at least I don't foresee us dramatically changing the law. I think it is more likely that we'll see the rise of technical solutions that are not that different from um, those of us who remember Napster and LimeWire and um, all of the kind of music issues in the early 2000s, you know, what emerged from that were a lot of technical solutions, right? The the uploading of music, you know, dummy music um, that would frustrate people, uh, uh, anti-circumvention technologies. I think that we'll see a lot of that um, before we'll see a lot of dramatic legal changes, at least in my view. I don't know if others have something to share on that. I, I just just on the data sets, I think that there is, I mean, clearly there's some space here for discussion. I mean, one, one can also see a global dimension to it. So the, the view in Japan and Singapore is markedly different from the view in Europe or parts of Europe and 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 then the, the US. So um and I, I think the um you know the the, the challenge of web scrape data. And certainly models, because, you know, if one looks forward here, and I'm just not advocating any position one way or the other, we're simply trying to focus on climate. But um, for most of the developing world, by the hundreds of millions of people, um, these AI things will become their teacher. That is the reality of it. That it, it presents an educational opportunity for hundreds of millions of people um, um, in the same way as social media became their friend, in the same way of these things. That is the world we're in. I mean, that's clearly what's going to happen. And so the question is, um, is this the best of our knowledge? Um, is this the best of our thinking um, there? And, um, and web scrape data ain't it. <laughs> Not close. 
And um, so we have tremendous knowledge um, in, in, in published works um, with great depth and, and, and knowledge and et cetera, et cetera. But there's a classic case where you'd ask um, a large chat model and uh, how many people um, live on Mars and it will confidently say 2 billion. Uh, and, um, you know, because it's read a science fiction book where there's a future where there's 2 billion and as large as the machines wouldn't know the difference. And, um, and so, you know, obviously this has been treated and this has been taken up as people work at these classes of problems. But the, the question here is we have an educational opportunity for hundreds of, uh, of millions of people, if not billions of people, um, uh, in an entirely different and challenging future leading ahead. And how do we get the best tools in their hands? And that may not be commercial tools, that probably is open tools, that probably is trained on different sets of data, but that is the future we're going in. Yeah, can, can I comment something about that? Because I feel like um, this is one of the risks of, uh, not of AI, of us with AI, which is like just perpetuating certain relations, geopolitics. Um, mm -hmm. Why, the develop if there is any developing world, why they will be is an opportunity for for them, and what will happen with the non developed the already developed world or the Western world? Because my feeling, I was in Europe until two years ago when I moved to Australia for twelve years. I'm from South America. I'm living in different countries, working in different countries, studying in different countries. What I've seen in the last ten years, in I mean two years ago, 10 years back, is like a divide between people that are actually getting an education in institutions or are um, with a, a system of education and people that are accessing to other kind of education that are considered like secondary universities or things like that. And this divide and who will be accessing to the top 10 universities and who will be studying in universities are like just uh, not as uh, yeah, considered as the other ones. It's, it's a tendency I have seen more in the Western world than in the, what, what's called the developing world. What I've, I've seen, at least in Latin America, which is my the region I come from, is, um, and particularly with AI, it's not that they are using an AI, they are trying to get an, an, an economic and an kind of uh, economical relationship with AI, trying to, or selling their own capacity of creativity or consuming what could help them to create uh, an ability to make money. So this is less uh, related with the advance of any kind of knowledge that eventually can end up in, in a better life. But actually, the, and I think I'm coming back to something that Sally and Charlotte said, which I I think it's really important to consider is like the contingents of the moment when people take decisions, how people consume, relate, and 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 what people will green light with any technology is completely related to the, the constellation they are in in life, in there. Um, so any prediction on what AI will impact the developing country, I think we we should be really careful to think that because actually the we don't know, we have no idea, uh, except that we believe that ge the geopolitics will continue like they are, you know, a center of developing technology for others to consume. That could probably could happen, but I want to believe that things will change at a certain point, at least with technology. And th those are some of the really uh, excellent uh, points, it's not only that we, uh, that AI is not one technology, but a set of uh, technologies. It is also what AI means in different parts of the world and in different contexts of use. We, I don't know whether we will have the time today to talk about so-called invisible labor and data workers who are, for example, at this moment working in Lebanon or in Syria and and so on and you know practices about big uh, platforms in uh, appointing those workers and work conditions in in uh, labor conditions in their working so maybe we'll have the time to talk about that but i would like to go now to one of the questions from the audience and it is interesting that daniel was talking about 
books that would tell you that there are 2 million people living on Mars, because the question for you, Daniel, is re exactly related to that. So the question is, uh, are articles considered but climate GPT peer reviewed? How far is this a criteria for inclusion as uh, it could underline the importance of a stronger weight of human create creative judgment? So um, the articles which we reference at the bottom, um, they're, um, uh, it's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, which, which isn't much very important, but when one when, when looks at an article and then you find sort of a vector of what that article is about and you see if that matches the response and you can influence a model's responses based upon those articles. So it, it is close to a reference, but it, 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 you know, it isn't quite the same as we would use references uh, as we would understand references, certainly in our terms, um, um, there. And so we have focused there, not, not just on peer-reviewed articles, but also uh, if, if the OECD writes something. And these are broader public intention research reports there. So they're not peer-reviewed in that sense, but they're uh, developed by the United Nations, by, uh, in this case, in the Club of Rome, there are reports for the Club of Rome uh, in the partnership. So there's various of those tasks. And so... They're, they're a bit broader than just the peer-reviewed um, section, but we certainly weighted um, towards, uh, because our job is to try to get, and it doesn't always work, but the closest, most factual answers with multiple perspectives on them um, to bring our um, actions just a little bit further. You know, the difference in our yearly spend um, on reaching, you know, net zero and then actual zero and then taking the carbon out of the air is, you know, uh, early action um, is probably a, around a trillion per year and um, delayed action is around five plus trillion per year. So early action matters uh, massively um, to global health and, and you know, as, as well as um, sensible action matters. So we just try to ground those responses um, within the best knowledge that we have. Um, and, and maybe one other um, note here, um, which I, I was starting to mention is that our model was trained on green power. It's the first uh, foundational family of models um, that had a sustainability scorecard in the paper when it was launched. So it's quite viable to run, build these models on green power. It's, it was a non-trivial exercise um, to achieve that. And an inference today, openly publicly available, um, and it still runs on, on green power. And so, uh, and the big, big part of the team that built it is in Africa. Um, so not just, uh, you know, these are, you know, seen as impossible hurdles, to, but they're actually quite viable um, if one puts um, effort into it. And, and I'm not saying many of the bigger players aren't um, concerned about that, um, but it is quite viable um, um, to achieve these things with green power. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have only five minutes left. Uh, I would encourage uh, members of the audience, if you have any last minute questions, please do post them in the chat or in the questions and answers section. And until we get the next question, uh, one question that I have, and that's something that pretty much all of the panelists were talking about, starting from Sally's points on whether we need radiologists at all, uh, and you know, to uh, Charlotte's points about uh, you know, lawyers need to ensure that they are not being replaced. Although there are some assessments that actually law professionals might be the first or among the first yes. to be replaced by by AI. Uh, my question is: When you think about the future of work, uh, what kind of professional reskilling? do you see will really be necessary and what kind of professional reskilling would be useful actually to have? The question is for all the panelists. So maybe I can just say one thing very quickly and then I, I'm certain that Deborah will have a lot to say on this. So I wanna reserve time for Deborah. Um, I think that we have to be cautious. And the reason I say this is because we're dealing with a connected electronic system. So something that we've actually seen, and this is not related to AI, but is related to cyber attacks and ransomware attacks, is that we've had medical professionals, for example, 
um, who can't use their medical devices because the medical devices at the hospital are all internet connected, connected to the network. And many of them have forgotten how to use analog machines. Um, and they've had to dig things out of closets in some cases, <laughs> um, ultimately to do it. So one, one just caution I think is this concept of trained incapacity that we get to a point where we have, you know, reduced the amount of people who can do the work and the people who are still doing the work now no longer know how to use an alternative. I think that's mm. very scary um, in a lot of fields, not specific to law, though, because it's kind of different for us, but um, for a lot of essential uh, workers in particular. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to comment on the future of work and questions about uh, reskilling, Sally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your example, um, Charlotte, reminded my university was hacked about five years ago and uh, on the 24th of December. And, you know, it was all hands on deck to get everything ready for when the students came back uh, in early January. And it turned out, and you know, this, you know, that everything was connected to everything else, including the beamers in classrooms. You couldn't use them because they were all connected to the network. I thought, well, in God's name, are the beamers connected? And, you know, I helpfully said, well, do we still have any overhead projectors anywhere? And, you know, my colleagues under 40 wouldn't know how to use an overhead projector. They'd get everything upside down and back front. And um, there was one somewhere. But anyway, um, but I completely agree that kind of, um, you know, we do need to remember how to do things in case it all goes really, really badly wrong either very locally or kind of on a more global level. And I think that's especially true um, for medical professionals. Um, I know, you know, the student doctors at my university sometimes complain about why they're being taught to use a steth stethoscope. And you say, well, you might need it one day, um, which seems kind of pretty basic. Um, but I think the other thing I would want to add to all of this, and I sort of hinted at it earlier, is I think you know, we do live in an incredibly technological society and world that whether you're a brain surgeon or a lawyer or anything else, understanding your increasingly large statistically based machines and tools of your work is really, really important, I think. Also to understand the, the possibilities, but also the limits of the, the tools that you're working with. So I think whatever the kind of domain, we all need to kind of try and get to speed or at least some understanding of what the kind of possibilities and risks are of these things. I completely agree with Charlotte and Sally. And I feel like the main point of this, and I don't want to introduce this as kind of like new threats, but actually most of people like, I mean, the thing is if quantum computing actually happened in the level that this conversation will be completely out of, of time. Um, so it's not, I feel like thinking about skilling or reskilling, or I, I feel like I may, I, I try to make the point in, in, in the conversation is having a really provincial um, view in terms of it is needed. Like we need to talk about it. It's not, but I think we need to understand the context of it's not catching up with the new technology. It's not catching up with emerging technology. And I don't want to use this, but we need like a literacy in technology and we need to understand the transformation in situ in the industry in the context and one of the things that i learned in 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 the project platcom which is this project how how platform workers learn to work digitally learn to work with algorithms is learning is a process that never happened in abstract always happen in the working context for construction for health for law for everybody for the social science for so understanding the process of learning and how um, learning to work um, and, and understanding how technology is related and constitute that work in the job, in the practice, and, and, and giving um, it tools to think with, to work with, to relate to technology in practice and, and, and in, in the career, in pre preparing to be professional, whatever professional means, I think it's much more important to think which kind of particular skills they need now or need for, because we will be always chasing something that will never exist. Um, and, and, and really, if quantum computing happened, so I hope somebody will remember how to, at least the health professionals, <laughs> Otherwise, we will be all of us in church asking God to, to whatever. Yeah. 
and it's not Deborah. science fiction. Th thank you, Deborah, so much. Uh, we have one more question for uh, for uh, for Charlotte, and I will just read it because we are unfortunately out of time. So uh, I will just read the question: How can ethical issues be included in regulations concerning AI? So uh, definitely one of the very uh, important questions. I also, as I said, have a bunch of questions. So this only means that we need one more session to continue our conversation. But unfortunately, we are out of time for today. I wanted to thank all of you for your time and for your really uh, great insightful uh, contributions to this uh, discussion that is very important. Thank you for the World Academy of Arts and Science uh, for hosting us and for giving us an opportunity to talk about this. Thank you, Nebusha, for organizing this. And uh, I wish uh, a beautiful uh, rest of the day or evening to all of you. And I hope that you will continue uh, the discussion about all of these important questions.